morning. Um, just as I start, let, let me just echo um, what Hamilton and Rob said during during our news around Equip. Um, just to keep it, you know, to the Bible course, please don't miss on that. Um, you know, every survey that I've read has said that those people that engage daily with the Bible do better in life. So the stats at the same time in our own church surveys have said that only 50% of Christians pick up their Bible from one Sunday to the next. That means that it's either you or the person sat next to you. So if it's you, pick up the flyer now and fill it out. If it's not you, then it's the person sat next to you. So have, a, have an encouraging word um, for them would be fabulous. Um, and the second, the second thing is the life beyond lost cause. That's the one that I signed up for, um, simply because you know I, I've experienced loss this year, and I don't want to make the assumption that I'm going to do well through that process. So I'm going to engage with that just to make sure that I do process that in, in a good way. So my encouragement for you is you might be doing really fine in that, wonderful, just make sure. And if you're not doing fine, then it's a great thing to connect with. So please don't miss those opportunities. Wonderful. Let, let me ask you a question. If you ever had a need to catch a monkey, what are you going to do? If you ever, ever had a need to catch a monkey, how are you going to go about doing it? Here, here, here is apparently a, a way to do it. Um, it is called the South Indian Monkey Track. And apparently what you need to do is follow out a coconut. And you make a hole in one end, which is just slightly bigger than a monkey's paw. And then you put a cane on the other end and you tie it to a tree or a space or something like that. And then you put some sweet rice into the coconut. And then you wait. And what happens is the monkey comes along and puts its paw into the coconut, grabs the rice, and then finds it can't take its paw out anymore. Now, you might say, well, the obvious thing to do is to just let go of the food and to withdraw your paw. The problem is this. Monkeys have a mental barrier to letting go of the food. They can't do it. They can't do it. There is something in the brain of a monkey that when it grabs hold of food, it is physically unable to let go of it again. And so the monkey is literally trapped by an idea that is now lethal to it. And all it has to do is open its mouth. The freedom, all it has to do is open its mouth. Now, just to be really clear this morning, whatever some experts say, I don't believe that we are monkeys. But we also have a tendency to grip things You've been around young children. One of them has a toy, a football, a sweet smile. And an adult will say, Well, why don't you share? No. No. And as adults, we behave in pretty similar ways. It's my money. I earned it. I deserve it. I'm entitled to it. This is my time. This is me time. This is mine. I deserve it. Benson spoke back in February just brilliantly about consumerism. It is really easy in our world to live with a closed fist, to hold on to things very tightly. But I believe that Jesus asked us to live a different way. He asked us to live with an open Living with an open hand is really important if you want to do well in life as a Christian. If you're here this morning and say, well, I haven't made a decision for Jesus yet, you are incredibly worth it this morning. And I hope that what we share today gives you some insight into the life that Jesus invites us to be a part of and that he's reaching out to you with this morning. So we're going to talk about living with an open hand. It's our new theory open hand, releasing compassion and generosity. Uh, we're going to track through this for the next three weeks. I would love you to make a commitment to that. If you're part of that church, be a part of this for the next three Sundays.
And during this series, we're going to share what I think are some wonderful, exciting developments for our storehouse compassion ministry. We're going to show a video that is coming, so please don't miss out on that. In part of this series, we are going to talk about money. And I know that we don't like talking about money. You, you may have had this experience where you go out for a shared meal with friends. And then you get to that very awkward bit about, like, how is the bill going to get settled? And everyone is kind of going through their head, how is this going to work? Are we going to, um, are we going to each pay for what we ate? So we need to get the menu out and then work that out? Or, or are we just going to split the bill, you know, in equal portions? And if that's the case, then what happens if that person has space and I have to cheat further because they're not left out? So I've got to have the space. And, and it gets really awkward. And then there's this moment where it's the settling up of the bill at the end. And it's like you're doing a drug deal. And then suddenly you're splitting people this little bit of money. It's really awkward. We don't like talking about it. You know, in a church, it is way, way easier to talk about sex, drugs, politics, I would even go to say blackness, than it is to talk about money. So why would we talk about money? Well, here's a couple of reasons why not. The question, is God himself in financial difficulty? No. Is the church in financial difficulty? No. God has been so gracious to us. So why talk about money? Here are three quick reasons. The first is this. God does not need our money, but he does want our heart. God does not need our money, but he does want our heart. You see, the truth is this. When we say yes to Jesus, we actually give him everything. Absolutely everything. And that includes all of our financial resources. You see, he's got the whole of me, and money is just one representation of where my heart is. Second reason, giving is a spiritual discipline that we must not ignore. Over 40% of Jesus' stories were about money. And if you look at the Bible as a whole, there are around about 500 verses on prayer and 2,000 verses on giving. It's be well to take attention to that. And the third reason is that for us in this church, Riverside Vineyard Church, we want to be the most generous church for our community. We want to be marked as people that live with an open hand, that are marked by living with compassion and generosity. So, if you have a Bible with you this morning, could you turn to Luke chapter 18? Over these next three weeks, we're going to look at three stories from Luke 18 and 19. So you might have a paper Bible, you might have a, a digital, you know, on the phone or whatever. The word will come up on the screen in a moment. The first story that we're going to look at in this series is verses 18 to 30 of Luke chapter 18. I'm going to read from the message version this morning. So if you're familiar with this story, it might just sound a little bit um, different to us. So from verse 18, one day, one of the local officials asked him, as our Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to deserve eternal life? That's a big question. Really big question. Jesus said, Why are you calling me good? No one is good, only God. And Paul, Jesus is not denying that he's God. He is simply provoking a response in this time, saying, Who do you think I am? Who do you think? You know the commandments, don't you? No illicit sex, no killing, no stealing, no lying. Honor your father and mother. He said, I kept them all for as long as I can remember. Wow. Good time. Good time. When Jesus heard that, he said, then there's only one thing left to do. Sell everything you own and give it away to the poor. You will have riches in heaven then come, follow me. That was the last thing the official expected to hear. He was very rich and became terribly famous. He was holding on tight to a lot of things and not about to let them go. Remember the monkey? Seeing his reaction, Jesus said, 
do you have any idea how difficult it is for people who have it all to enter God's kingdom? I say it's easier to spread a camel through a needle's eye than get a rich person into God's kingdom. Then who has any chance at all? The other guy. No chance at all, Jesus said, if you think you can pull it off by yourself. Every chance in the world if you trust God to do it. Peter tried to regain some initiative. We left everything we owned and followed you, didn't we? Yes, said Jesus, and you won't regret it. No one who has sacrificed home, spouse, brothers and sisters, parents, children, whatever, will lose out. It will all come back, multiplied many times over in your lifetime. And then the bonus part is going on. Anyone feeling a little bit uneasy or uncomfortable yet? Just me? Challenge is tough, isn't it? And if someone tells you that uh, being a Christian is for weak people, show them a text like this. This is what Jesus asks of us. You know, one way, if you're someone that reads the gospel stories in the Bible, have you ever noticed that Jesus always gave more than was needed? Have you noticed that? Did Jesus turn up at a wedding and they'd run out of wine? And so Jesus turned what was probably about 150 gallons of water into fine wine. Way more than was needed. Jesus went to a picnic. 5,000 people that have gotten food. And instead of just providing enough food, Jesus provided enough so that there were 12 baskets of leftovers. Just more. Jesus went to dinner with one of his friends called Peter. Peter's mother-in-law was sick. And so Jesus healed her and then healed everyone who was sick in the entire town. That's Jesus. You see, Jesus was someone who lived with an open hand, who released abundance into our world. And that is what he asked us to do. You see that in verse 22. When Jesus heard what this young guy was saying, he said, there's only one thing left to do. Sell everything you own and give it away to the poor. You will have riches in heaven, then come, follow me. Jesus asked us to live with an open hand. In other words, let go. Think about the money. Let go. And you know, it's not just money that we need to kind of loosen our grip on. It's things like our time, our will, our emotions, our heart, our agenda in life, our hopes and dreams. Let it go. But money is important because money is something that we so often have a very hard grip on in life. The great theologian Martin Luther said this. He said there were three conversions necessary in the Christian life. The conversion of the head, the conversion of the heart, and the conversion of the purse or the wife. And I would suggest the hardest of those three is the wife. Forty percent of Jesus' stories, as I said, are about money. And I believe that's because he knows how tightly you can grip onto financial resources. And what Jesus is saying to us this morning is, open your hand. Open your hand. Live with an open hand. Now, when Jesus says that to the official in our story, the reaction is, is quite striking. But let me read it again, verse 23. Because so this is the last thing the official expected to hear. He thought he'd done a really good job in life. This was the last thing he expected to hear. He was very rich. He became terribly sad. He was holding on tight to a lot of things and not about to let things go. Living with an open hand is not easy. It is not easy. When we say yes to Jesus, he gets everything. He gets it all. All of our money, all of our time, all of our energy, all of our hopes and dreams, he gets it all. What that means is that he is now Lord over our time and money and not us. And so what we do with that time and the money is no longer our decision. If we said yes to Jesus, it's now his decision. How many of you have found that a really easy thing to do? Oh, is it? Or is it just me? 
Are you the most sanctified bunch of people this side of glory? It may, it may, it so you need to pray for me because I find it hard. I find it hard to give Jesus absolutely everything. Full surrender is not easy, but there is good need for us this morning. Listen to what Jesus says in verses 26 and 27. Now, here's where he says, Then who has any part at all? In other words, Jesus is what you're asking. Just start there. Who has any chance of living the way that you are supposed to live? And this is what Jesus says. No chance at all if you can think, if you think you can put it off by yourself. Every chance in the world if you trust God to do it. See, the good news is that God helps us to live with our hands. We find it hard, God helps us. You see, one of the things that I, that I love is the way that God is fully committed to you and to me for us to become like Jesus. He is fully committed to that process. He is so fully committed that he sent his son Jesus to live and to die and to be resurrected because he's 100% committed to us. He's so committed to us that he sent his Holy Spirit to live within us for hope of glory. 100% committed to us. And so, in the light of God's commitment to us, one of the great Christian prayers is this. Help. It's a complex, theologically loaded prayer. Help. I need help. So we simply come on our knees to Jesus. Come be the force of Jesus. I need your help. Jesus, I want to live life with an open hand. I want to be someone who lives with compassion and generosity. I want to be someone who releases abundance into our world. But Jesus, I'm fighting it hard. And Jesus, I'm not coming asking that you would help me to win the battle with money in my life. To win the battle with sex, with addiction, with how I use my time. Jesus, I need your help. These are battles that are bigger than me. I need your help. We come and we ask for his help. Open hands is what Jesus asked us to do, living with compassion and generosity. So, what does this mean for us in this season of action here at River Club What does it mean for us? Well, there are lots of things that I love about the Venus and the churches and that I love about this church. One of them that's right up on the top of the list is the way that we tend to the poor. That is right up at the top of the list for me. John Wimber, who was the founding pastor of the Vineyard Family Church, used to say this, If you don't care for the poor, don't put the main vineyard over the door. If you don't care for the poor, don't put the main vineyard over the door. It is right at the heart of who we are. Now, for us in this church, our main compassion ministry project is something that we call Storehouse. Storehouse was established over 20 years ago. It serves hundreds of families each year who find themselves in physical need, in poverty. And they are referred to us by over 80 professional agencies. So health visitors, social workers, GPs, schools, refer families to us. And Storehouse provides emergency food, children's clothing, toys, equipment like brands and pots and things like that. Um, baby camps for, for newborn babies. They are a thing of beauty, the way that they are given to those that have just had children. Um, there are four allotments that are being cultivated that provide fresh food and vegetables for uh, those families that are in need. Um, there's a drop-in cafe that provides connection and relationship and belonging for families. Um, we're looking to empower those families through things like money management courses, running happiness courses, things like that. And I know that there are many in our church that care deeply about the And the reason for that, I believe, is this. It touches our heart because it's God's heart. That's why, if you've wondered why do I care about the it's because it touches our heart because it's God's heart. That's why it resonates so deeply with us. Now, for the past two or three years, God has been increasing the dreams that we have for the Storehouse Project. And a couple of years ago, we started this journey into this new future of Storehouse by building a new toy storeroom. Well, some of you would have been around at the time when we built that and opened it. That, that's just a picture of it. And some of you would have gone and seen that room. It's, it's in the back part of the building. For me, this is one 
one of my most favorite rooms in the whole church sector. It is peaceful, it is beautiful, but most of all, the reason that I love it the most is because it is a space where we can serve families in need with incredible generosity and greater dignity. And I love the way that it helps us to do that. Now, we said at the time that we built that, that we would love to do the same with our provision of food and clothing to families in poverty. And so this is what Storehouse looks like right now. Um, the clothes are, are provided on temporary clothes rails and in these uh, delightful plastic boxes. So what happens when a, a family comes in and we take a box off the shelf, put it on a table, and they go rummaging through uh, to find stuff. The equipment, pots and pans, is really hard to get to. This is the area that's affectionately known as the gallery, which is out of the And at times, it feels literally like a mission of death and danger to go and get a pan or a pot. You're, you're rummaging through stuff, you're worried what's going to fall off the shelf, uh, just not at all easy. And in terms of that food storehouse, at the moment it runs from a small room over in the back part of the building. And there's not enough room for families to get into that room, so what the team does is to pack bags for the family, and we just hope that we get it right. We, we hope that we put the stuff in there and um, that is useful to them. Now, our dream as a church is to create a space for people to stop free of stuff, where people can go and choose stuff for themselves. We want people that come in, that are part of storehouse, that were serving through storehouse, to be able to break up stuff, just like any of us do when we go and pick up our stuff. So they can have that experience, that we can serve them with that great efficiency, so they can go and choose what is helpful for them as family. But to move into this new season will require a significant redevelopment of the space that is used by storehouse. And we believe that the time to do this is now. Now is the time for us to Now is the time. Thank you. Now is the time. God is speaking to us. We want to serve with an open hand, releasing compassion and generosity now in this time. So where is this space? Let me orientate you around that for a bit. Go on to this next slide. This is the ground floor of the Vineyard Center. If you weren't quite sure where you are right now, you're in the auditorium. I hope that's not a surprise. Um, but that's the bottom right-hand corner here. If we zoom in to the back part of the building, storehouse is very much kind of Gathered. It doesn't work particularly well in terms of the way the space is laid out and the ways that we can serve families that come in. So here's what we dream of doing. It's creating a whole dedicated part of our building to storehouse compassion ministry. Creating space where we can create these areas of stop right system so people can come in and see clothes and pick up food and have that dignity of being served in that way. We're also very aware that we need to create more space for, for food donations. Our requirement for food is going up and up and up, month by month. And we've got some ideas of how we can help businesses contribute to that, and supermarkets, but we need space to be able to develop ministry in that way. And so, um, it's very much creating a brand new space, redeveloping the, the area that we especially call the gallery, creating proper spaces where we can serve families that are in poverty. What might this physically look like on the ground? Well, the storehouse team, together with Elliot, has put together a fantastic video um, that talks about that. I, I watched it last week, I had tears in my eyes. I've spoken to a bunch of other people who, who got a preview of the video. They were crying as well. We're going to show it next Sunday. So please come, come to church with a tissue and don't miss it because it is stunning. It gives us a glimpse of the future that Jesus is calling us into, of how we can live with an open hand of releasing compassion and generosity. So please don't miss that next weekend. But here's a little thing. Here's a picture from the video that we're going to show next week.
the just is an idea of the spaces that we are wanting to share. And we believe that we can do this together because together we can serve families that are in poverty with greater dignity and with compassion and with generosity. Now, at the same time, on the other wing of the old part of the building, we're aware of some fairly pressing needs that we need to address. These are in the rooms that are used primarily on the ground floor by our youth, by young people, and on the third floor by our young teenage children. And this is what those rooms come and look like. It's specifically the windows in those rooms. Those, the windows are really old. They are, they've been here way longer than we have been in this room. They do not shut properly. The rooms are drafty. They are difficult to heat. That is not good for the environment and is definitely not good for any utility. And they need desperate means of replacement. And what we would love to do is something like this. We, we need to serve our young people and children in the best way that we can. Now, all of this taken together, this is a significant project. We have this estimated a project cost of about £75,000. And to give you more detail of that, we have produced a brochure for everyone that is a part of our church. I'm opening up my envelope, which contains my brochure, and it looks like that, releasing compassion and that will give you a whole lot more detail of what we believe Jesus is saying to us as a church. If you are in a small group or you're on one of our serving teams, there is an envelope at the back of the auditorium with your name on it this morning. Uh, we'd love you please to go and pick that up because that will save us a whole lot of posting. If there isn't one with your name on it and you are in a group or on a team, you have our apologies in advance. It's just possible that your leader has not let us know until we didn't have an updated list this morning. But there are also a whole pile of blank envelopes this morning. So if you can't find your envelope or you're not yet on a team or maybe you're just visiting this morning and you want a copy of this, please pick up one of those envelopes. Bottom line, I would love everyone that's here this morning as part of our church to leave with an envelope. So would you do that? Would you help us by doing that this morning? In this envelope, you'll find uh, the brochure um, and also a response card, which we'd love everyone to prayerfully consider um, and to bring along to the service in two weeks' time on the 19th of May. And so over these next two weeks, here are five things I want to invite everyone to do. If you're part of our church, I want to invite you to do this. The first thing is this. Would you read the brochure? It's going to take you about five minutes. Please have a read of the brochure. Second thing, would you take this season in our church's life to review your finances, including giving, in the light of the wisdom of the Bible? And to help with that, we've got a little booklet which we call Generous Giving, which helps us to think about what the Bible says about finances. For example, it helps us to think about the issue of tithing. Is that, does that apply to New Testament Christians? What do we think about that? It helps us to think about um, the local church being the focal point of our giving. So please, would you do that over the next couple of weeks? Third thing, please pray. Please pray about your regular giving to Riverside Vineyard Church if this is the church that's coming for you. And when you pray, would you ask the Lord to speak to you, listen, and then trust Him by doing what He says? That's what they're for, isn't it? Ask, listen, and then trust by doing what He says. Because He can be trusted. Fourth thing, would you at the same time please consider whether you are able to give over and above your regular giving? to this open hand project that's part of our ongoing church planting development. We believe that together we can press into this future. And the fifth thing then is to simply complete the response card, bring it along to the service on the 19th of May. If you're away that weekend, you can send it directly into the church office or hand it in at the information point. You know, in all of this, one of the things that I love the most 
basically the way that Jesus invites us to be a part of what he's doing in our world. So could, you, could you see that in the story that we read? When Jesus has this interaction with this, this official, he says to him, man, you're doing, it, you're, you're doing well, but there's, there's one thing. Sell what you've got and give it to the poor. In other words, he was inviting him to partner in what God was doing in the world. And that is an incredible privilege, isn't it? I find that a huge privilege that Jesus would invite people like me, people like you, to be a part of what he's doing in our world, including serving the poor. We get to be a part of that. And so this official is invited in to be a part of releasing compassion and generosity into his world. And so are we. And that is a huge privilege. But it takes us living with an open hand. Living with an open hand enables us to be a part of what God is doing. But it's going to take an open hand. But if we live with a tight, closed hand, we'll be like the monkey. Freedom gets taken away from us. Jesus asks us to live with an open hand. But living with an open hand positions us to be used by Jesus. And at the heart of the story that we read, Jesus essentially asked the official a question. And I believe he asked us the same question. It's a really challenging question, but it's one that I believe we need to have an answer to. The question is this. What's in your hand, and what are you going to do with it? That's a big question, but it's a really important question. What is in your hand, and what are you going to do with it? Not what is in somebody else's hand, that's their issue. Not what you wish was in your hand, or what used to be in your hand. What is in your hand, and what are you going to do with it? You see, we can only ever come to Jesus as we are. And we can only ever give from what he has given to us. So what is in your hand, and what are you going to do with it? And what I also love in this story, and you may have picked this up, is the way that if we will do that, if we will respond to what Jesus says and live with an open heart, there is reward. There is blessing. Did you see that verse 22? When Jesus has the start of this interaction, he says to him, you know, if you do this, there will be riches in heaven for you. And at the end of the story, and I'll read verses 29 and 30 again, this is what Jesus says to him. He says, you won't be granted. No one who has sacrificed home, spouse, brothers and sisters, parents, children, whatever, will lose that. It will all come back, multiplied many times over in your lifetime, and then the bonus of eternal life. Living with an open hand is trapped God's blessing. It's trapped God's blessing. Now let me be very clear. If you do, I don't think there is a promise you can find in the Bible that says you're going to get rid I don't see that. But you will be blessed. You will be blessed. I mean, I don't know about you, but I want to be blessed. So I'm going to do all that I can to live with an open hand. What about you? Do you want to be blessed? Do you, or do you want to be like that monkey that gets trapped? It's a powerful example. If you hold on tight, we lose freedom. Open hand to release the blessing of freedom. It's what Jesus asked us to do. It's what he asked us to do. Let me close with this. Some of you may have heard of a Dutch lady called Corrie Ten Boom. She and her family helped many Jews escape from the Nazi Holocaust by, by physically hiding them. She was eventually caught, she was arrested and sent to a concentration camp. And she's written some wonderful books, probably one of the most famous of the book called The Hiding Place. And she, she wrote this, and I think this is so wise. I have learned to hold all things loosely so God will not have to pry them out of my hand. I have learned to hold all things loosely so God will not have to pry them 